Without further ado, I am going to turn the presentation over to Zach and Artisha. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Heather. Let's see. I need to set up my screen here real quick. Give me one second. There's way too many buttons to fly a spaceship program these days. <laughs> All right, so thanks for coming, everybody. Um, this is probably one of my favorite programs to do just because it kind of lays it all out there. And I really enjoy presenting with Artisha because we do not give you fluff. We tell you exactly what it needs to be. Um, we're not going to lead you down a, a stray path. We're gonna tell you just what you need to know. So uh, I'm excited to share that with you. So today, um, upon completing today's training, you will be able to, or you should be able to, determine what your organization needs to be grant ready. And that can mean a lot of things. You, if you're new, we're gonna show you a checklist uh, of things that you should probably have in place. Or if you're, you've been around for a few years, you're gonna kind of know a little bit more about the pieces that you'll be looking for before you get started immediately. And then we're gonna understand the life cycle of a grant, what it means from the beginning to the end and all the pieces in between. Uh, we'll talk about how to approach a funder. Largely, that's going to be um, what Artisha has to share today. And then we'll know uh, how to find and evaluate grants. So let's get started. So the very basics, and uh, this might seem, oh, I went too far. This might seem a little remedial, but I think it's important to get the, the basic definitions kind of out there. So what is a grant or a grant proposal? So most staff members in nonprofit organizations define grant proposals as requests for money, but that is kind of a superficially correct definition to achieve better results uh, for, for constituents and to move toward missions, nonprofits need to think of grants in a different way. First, nonprofits must consider grants from a funder's, funder's point of view and for a funder, a grant is uh, an award or an investment and in positive change. It's a tool that funders use to have an impact on specific issues that they and their donors care about. And sometimes donors and foundations are the same um, if it's a private one person foundation or a family foundation. So nonprofits need to consider grants from uh, more of a mission focused perspective. Since the point of a grant award is impact rather than money, the real point of a grant proposal is uh, to rally the necessary resources in your community to help a nonprofit fulfill its purpose and mission. A grant should be considered uh, a tool for nonprofit use to address those important issues within a community rather than just a check. Definitions do matter and defining grant proposals accurately can help both the funder and the nonprofit work together more productively. Uh, a grant proposal is really, if you think about a call to action, it's a request that a funder join the nonprofit as a partner in achieving specific results. At its best, a grant proposal is a cogent, persuasive, well-supported argument for change. And uh, I also help business people. And so I kind of think that a grant proposal and a business proposal for funding are very similar. They're just two sides of the same coin. No grant is the same. I mean, sorry, no two grants is, are the same. There, there's not one way to write it. And we'll, we'll kind of cover that in a second, but you should never ever submit one grant to a million different funders thinking that you know, that's good enough. So, um, but first who gives grants? So we have listed here some different types of foundations. We have private foundations, community foundations, public charities, corporate giving programs, foreign grant makers and federal agencies. Now, most of those organizations want to give out money. That's why they exist. In fact, um, the IRS stipulates that private foundations have to give out 5% of their assets each year. So for a, a large portion of those organizations, they're legally required to give out money. So uh, that's something important to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about approaching a funder. You know, it's not scary to ask for money. That's, that's their job. It's just, you need to understand what you're doing in that scenario. So now I'm going to turn the next slide over to Artisha here to talk about what the Greater Toledo Community Foundation has in their portfolio. Good afternoon. Great to see, and I'm going to put C in quotation marks, everyone here. 
Um, so I'm just gonna briefly explain the different type of funds available at the Greater Toledo Community Foundation. Just a brief introduction. My name is Artisha Lawson. I serve as a program officer at the foundation. And my job is to answer questions from grant seekers to assist uh, nonprofits that receive grants through the monitoring process and to also lead and hold discussions with committees that are making um, the decisions based off my portfolio. So when it comes to this foundation, I'm gonna focus primarily on the 40%, which is comprised of FOI and unrestricted, that's field of interest and unrestricted funds, and also donor advised. That circle, um, that piece of the pie basically um, includes all the grants, or not all of them, but the majority of the grants that are open to competitive grant making opportunity, which are the same grants that you can see on our website and also on the portal. If you're not familiar with the portal, um, I'll provide some information later on in the presentation, but I do encourage, if you have questions as Zach and I are talking, drop them in the, the chat. That way we can um, discuss it as we go, because um, this is a discussion and not a lecture. I could definitely assure you of that. So field of interest and unrestricted, the biggest unrestricted um, funding opportunity is what we call community funds. Those have been redesigned to include community builder and community impact. The donor advised, those are more corporate and I'll give some examples later on in, in the presentation. So I just want to give you just a small sample of the different funds. We actually have over 900 different funds at the foundation. Those also in, include scholarships, which obviously um, is not for this audience. So um, that's basically what I wanted to share with you about the different type of funds. At other foundations, such as private, um, and then other funding sources, they're gonna differ. So anything you hear me saying from a funder's perspective, I'm primarily focusing on the foundation I represent, but there are other funding sources in our community as well. Zach? I guess I actually have a question for you. I don't know if sure. I've ever asked this before. What percentage does um, the Greater Toledo Community Foundation spend on their endowments? Oh. Endowments, it, it really um, varies because some are very direct, meaning they're, they're going directly to a particular um, organization. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately due to COVID that definitely put a hamper in what was a common quote unquote uh, trend. Um, so I really won't be able to answer that now only because we're still wrapping up the end of the year information. Those of you that you know like accounting purposes, <laughs> It's always fun when you're reaching the end of the year cycle, um, but I can definitely get that information before we close out. Okay, just wondering. I was just curious. I know uh, I've worked at the Finley um, Community Foundation before, and I think that theirs was four and a half percent on their endowments, but uh, I just know it's different. It's not legally mandated at a certain level for community foundations. Yep. So let's talk about some quick myths here on grant writing, grant seeking, grants in general. So the first one that I hear a lot is grants are free, easy money. Um, that is just a probably terrible frame of mind because it's not going to be free in the sense that you have to spend a lot of time on these proposals and you really need to factor that in when you're seeking proposals because sometimes it might not be worth it because if you have to spend a hundred hours on a proposal and you're only asking for a thousand dollars in the end, did you spend more than a thousand dollars to try to get that? grant in. So something to consider along the way. One size fits all. I kind of talked on this a little bit ago. When you are approaching a funder, you should really be tailoring that application to each and every funder. Even if it's the same program, every funder has different interests and different requirements. And so you can take pieces for sure um, and keep them the same, but you'll want to tailor every single application you're sending out there. Grant funding is an instant solution to our money problems and the timeline is never going to support that. So grants can take three to six months. They could even take longer. I mean, when you consider the whole life cycle, it can be years long, but 
the application process really depends on the foundation's timeline. They might meet monthly to discuss funding. They might meet annually, quarterly. And then how long is it going to take for them to get back to you on their decision? So it's not usually, uh, I, I found this grant, I'm going to apply this week. And by the end of the week, we are going to have a million dollars. It's just not how the process works. I can model my program after whatever the grant maker wants. No, 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 no. So that's actually the next slide. So start developing your program first. That helps guide you in finding funders. Uh, and that, that prevents what we consider to be mission creep. So before you start seeking mon money, it's important to have the idea in your head of what you want to get funded. Most often, it's a program that you've begun developing, but it can come in the form of operating or capital funds. It could be a new, exciting program that you just haven't, don't have the funds existing to, to kick off. It could be an expansion program, but it should be something in your wheelhouse and it should be based on your mission. Having a clear picture of that potential grant project will help you in finding funders who align with your mission and goals. It also um, will keep you on track in writing the grant. So if you write something, if you find a, a request for proposals out there that has, that's calling for applications for something that you don't do, leave it at that, don't do it. Don't start expanding your program base just because you wanna change those dollars. And how long is the grant cycle? I, I kind of touched on this. It just depends on the program. I said three to six months before you hear. So um, that's something that you might want to get a good idea of in advance. So if it's kind of a, a pinch program, if you're starting that in a couple weeks or a month and you need to find funding, you might want to look into a private donors rather than a grant. So here are just some things to consider to decide if you are grant ready. So continuity of leadership. It's kind of going back maybe a few years, there's no hard rule, but how long has it been since your leadership has switched out in your organization and how long was it before that? So if you've had the same director for four years and before that, four or five years, they're probably sitting pretty. But if you have uh, kind of a history in your organization of a new person in the, in the leadership role every six months, you might want to focus on that before starting to seek grants. Visionary leadership, what that means is, you know, are you just sticking with the status quo? Are you trying to really make a difference in your service area? Is, is the person at the helm really innovative? Um, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but if you're just kind of coming up with the same old project to work on that's been put in front of a funding board a thousand times, then you might not get that grant because they may have funded somebody else to do that already. Do you have a solid board and solid board support? And some foundations will ask you about this, some won't, it just depends on their priority. But do you um, include people on your board that are part of your service population? If you serve um, you know, recovering addicts, do you have any on your board? If you are um, a theater program, whether it's adults or children, do you have representation, whether it's someone in your theater or a parent of a student, are they on your board? And do they all, donate. It doesn't have to be a huge amount, but do you have 100% board support? Um, that I have seen on applications before. And you'll have to provide that information. Solid reputation in the community. I mean, they might seek references. Um, they, If they're in your community, they likely know about you. So um, that's something that should be in the back of your mind and work towards and, and maybe even kind of create a media campaign around organizational accomplishments and or impressive credentials of key individuals. So sometimes you'll be asked to provide resumes. And so you'll have to have people on your team that are qualified to do the work. And that will become pretty apparent when they ask for a resume and you're trying to find a specific program and they have never worked on anything like that ever before. <laughs> so credible track record with grantors and banks. And, and maybe not so much on the bank side when it comes to grants, but definitely with other grantors, a lot of these people know each other and they talk and you might even have people who have served on multiple organizations boards or as employees. So you have to approach every single relationship as if um, everyone else is going to know about that. So if you dropped the ball on a big grant project in the past and didn't make amends with that funder, um, that might affect other funders in your area. Sound accounting practices and systems. 
of course, we all want good record keeping, but it's usually recommended. Um, this is also the next bullet point that you have audited financials. It might be required for a grant. Uh, I think most will recommend that you have one done every three years. It does have a cost to it. So I think that's where people get a little lenient on having it done every single year. But um, an organization that has bad financials is probably going to be a no-go for, for funders. Effective program tracking and record keeping systems for reporting outcomes. So funders more and more are, are seeing grants as an investment. So they're going to want to see really positive outcomes and outputs from the, the grant programs that they're funding. So a lot of times it's more important to bake in evaluations into the grant proposal. You don't want to get to the end and then have to come up with some way to prove that you use the money to do what you said you would. That needs to be something that you have in the forefront. And then grant makers like to see existing networks of potential partners. So the, the more the merrier in, in this one, uh, there's, there's less and less dollars to cover more and more organizations out there. So if you can find a way to work with more partners, partners in your community, nonprofits or otherwise, uh, it'll kind of make you more of a polished product in developing your grant proposal. And the way that you show those partnerships on an official level is to have MOUs, which are memorandums of understanding and they um, kind of detail your partnership role and responsibilities. It's not actually a legally binding document, so it's kind of, it's not really scary to have to create one of those. And I have some templates if you ever want to have one of those sent to you. But um, I've been on a board before uh, to do some funding decisions, and there was a, a program put in front of us where it was nine partners who were supposed to work together to share resources. And they were asking for assistance to get that, that technical assistance and the, the, to get that hashed out with a, an advisor of sorts. And they could not get all of their partners to sign an MOU saying that they were on board with that. So why would we fund them knowing that uh, maybe one of those partners could drop out or they're not really in it? So it really is important to have all of that in, in submitting the proposal. You should have uh, show be able to show proof of an ability to handle large sums of money, and that kind of ties in with the next one. This is just a rule of thumb, but an annual annual budget of more than four times of the amount you're asking. So, you can't ask for five hundred thousand dollars if your annual budget is five hundred and forty thousand dollars. That's just not going to to work. The funder doesn't want to fund your whole organization. They want to fund specific projects that you're working on. And if you only ever had an operating budget of $500,000, then you certainly wouldn't want to ask for a million, which it goes to that third point, proof of ability to handle large sums of money. So all of that really needs to be uh, kind of thought about in advance. You can't just start a nonprofit and uh, think you're going to get a million dollars from some funder immediately and you're, you're, you're good to go. In fact, what I'm going to show you here next comes from Giving USA from their annual report, which the library has here if you ever want to see a copy of. When, when it comes to seeking funds, I, I often sh show this to people so that they can really get an idea of what the full picture looks like. So this is kind of a breakdown of philanthropy from 2019 across the entire nation. It breaks it down by gift type and by sector of of nonprofit, but what I like to focus on here is the gift type. So we can see the largest piece of that pie, 69% comes from individuals. So you should probably also have a reflection of that in your budget. It doesn't need to be the same percentage exactly. That's, that's probably impossible. Um, in fact, it's a little skewed on this because uh, most of the giving by individuals tends to go towards you know, the religious organizations. So that number is probably gonna be a little less but I think the trickle down effect would still be the same. So you're gonna have giving by individuals followed by maybe foundation grants and then bequests and corporations. Uh, you can probably flip some of those. I worked for an organization that had more giving by corporations than they would have bequest because that, it just didn't have the resources to work on planned gifts. But um, you can see that nobody should be funding 100% giving by foundations. And again, if you want to see this whole document and some of those trends by sectors, just uh, send me a message and you can do that. So 
let's focus on the life cycle for a second here of a grant. And what I like about this graphic from the University of Kansas is that it breaks it down into these individual pieces, pre-award and post-award. So today we'll probably focus more uh, on the finding funding part towards the end here. We're gonna take that out and we'll do it at the end. So what I usually help people with is that fine funding and preparing the proposal, whether they need to incorporate research. The library, we do not write grants for you, but um, we do help you get aligned to find the right person to apply, right organization to apply to and any type of you know, statement of need that you might need to work on, we can help you with. So once we, we find funding, we find a funder and we work on preparing that proposal, then we submit it and hopefully we'll get uh, award acceptance. And usually there's some sort of uh, documentation that you have to assign when you're accepting a grant if you've received one. And then, you know, then there's the time to put the program into place. Sometimes that timeline is a year. It could be three months. You would have specified that in the grant proposal. And that's the, the setup phase. And then we're, we're doing the monitoring, you know, the, the program is happening. We're making sure that we are doing exactly what we said. We're getting the deliverables we expected. If we're not getting those deliverables, then we probably need to talk to the funder and, and have a conversation on, on what's going differently than what you expect, expected. And then um, it's the closeout. You'll be submitting any after evaluations. You'll, 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 be held to, to a standard still, even at the very end, to report the details of your grant. So on the prepping side, since we'll cover the fine funding later, here are some documents that you can prepare early and have on file. And hopefully these aren't too difficult to get because a lot of funders are gonna look for these pieces. So the agency mission statement, that should be something you should easily have accessible. Could be on your website, um, just have that ready to go. It's gonna be asked for, and then your any certificate of incorporation, articles of incorporation from the state in your 501c3 letter of determination that will indicate that you are tax exempt. And of course, if you have your EIN, which you probably will because you need that for your 501c3 letter of determination, you might not have a DUNS number. That's um, it's largely for government grants. And if you ever need to get one, I can help you with that process. But these other pieces, I, I think that you, you can all keep them all kind of maybe in a file somewhere, either virtually or physically to have ready to go for a grant proposal. So your list of board members, annual record of board contributions, your organizational chart, how you're structured, any job descriptions for positions that might be involved, with the grant you're writing, uh, how many employees you have in that breakout, any bios or updated resumes that you might need. If you have an auditor's report, if you create an annual report, you'll, you might be asked to provide that. Uh, all current funding sources and potential sources. So that's probably gonna be in the budget actually. It's not really something that you're gonna have separately to pull out, but you probably will need to provide that. And these others, they might be more or less relevant depending on the grant you're writing. So some, it might be relevant to have a floor plan if you are, are getting some sort of grant related to your space, personnel policies and procedures, disaster plan, your a boilerplate language, any of those MOUs we talked about, and then any recent evaluations, assessment or publicity that can help make your case for the award. And so that's um, part of the pre-award, um, just getting ready, but then there's some other key terms to know about when you're, you're starting to apply are grant guidelines and um, RFP, request for a proposal, and those two can be confused sometimes. Um, so the guidelines are gonna be how you apply. It's going to tell you, you know, what kind of font you need to submit, what sections you're gonna need to put in. Um, not every foundation is going to have guidelines, in fact, more, Will, have, will not have them than will. You'll see a lot of detailed grant guidelines when it comes to government grants, and you really do need to read that. That, that package can be dozens, if not hundreds of pages sometimes. Whereas the RFP is a specific call for proposals. It's often published on websites or you might see it in a newspaper or something. An RFP request for proposal is saying that we have this specific pot of money and we're accepting proposals under this kind of specific area. It might be environmental, it might be education, it might be um, COVID related as we, we see a lot of those right now. Um, but 
most foundations aren't going to have those either. So I see those most often with community foundations, whereas um, the, the staff that I've seen through um, an organization that we work with called Candid, less than, than half of 1%, less than half of 1% of foundations actually create requests for proposals. An LOI, you'll see that a lot, and it can mean either a letter of inquiry or a letter of intent. They're pretty much the same thing. And so that's kind of like your pre-proposal. -pre uh, that can be the first step that a foundation wants. They don't all want just you to send out an entire completed proposal, and that could save you a lot of time, actually, is to do a letter of inquiry where it's a one or two page statement outlining your, your project and why you think that you'd be good for the funder and basically you're asking permission to submit a full proposal and then if you do get an, a, a, an award a grant you might be asked to sign the grant agreement with the terms of that um, the timeline any reporting that you might be expected to do and you'll often see that for a lot of foundations they have program officers who are in charge of that pre-award and often the grant agreement and post-award follow-up process and this is the perfect time to switch it back over to our resident program officer, Artisha, so she can cover um, their process. Yes, so with the foundation I represent, Greater Toledo Community Foundation, there is always a listed program officer. Um, I am going to mention, please read the grant guidelines several times. That's going to be your best source of information. It tells you the priorities of the fund. It, it'll tell you who or which fund it in the foundation is actually going to review it. Um, but there's always going to be information that's not included. So the first two points, conversations with the program officer and how to engage a funder, I'm gonna cover those interchangeably. The first thing you wanna do, whether it's a first time meeting or you just wanna to touch base, schedule time. Actually call and request an appointment. Um, unless you have a, a large organization that has several departments, you're operating in different states, usually 30 minutes is enough time, especially if it's an introduction. Whether it's an introduction or you want to touch base, you definitely want to carve out specific time where you have the full attention of that program officer. Now, again, keep in mind anything that I'm saying, I can only speak to the foundation that I work for. Um, but any other foundation, whether it's private or government, just follow the instructions on how or if they accept questions in advance. Some do. Some don't. So like I said, carve out that time. So what does it mean to touch base? Well, it really depends. If you or your organization is scaling up in a significant way and it's been two years, it's probably time to schedule another meeting. The only interaction with the foundation should not be your application. That should not be the first interaction we have with you. And that should not be the only interaction. How are we supposed to answer questions and know anything about your organization if we've never actually spoken to you or you haven't spoken to us? Um, our job here at the Community Foundation is to serve the community. So just keep that in mind when you're seeking grants it's okay to call the listed program officer. And if you don't know who it is, just call the office and say, you know, I, I have this foundation, I have this uh, nonprofit, I'm sorry, and I'm interested in finding out more about grants. Now that you've uh, asked that question and you're ready to schedule your meeting, what exactly do you ask? Well, I'm gonna give you a list of questions and I'll um, repeat them if you need me to, but this is just a sample listing. This won't answer every single question because you. first thing I'm always gonna say is refer to the grant guideline. Um, but here at the foundation, we actually have a list of all the annual open competitive grants that are offered at the foundation. So you can definitely call and ask for that. If you don't know anything else, you can ask for the list 
of open competitive grants. Usually, unless there's a change up, for example, we had a COVID uh, grant um, in the beginning of the stay at home order, that was a significant change, but now we're into a, a different phase. So what are some things that you want to you want to ask? So again, after you have that list, you are going to want to ask, what is the geography for that particular fund? Believe it or not, there are different geography requirements for grants, even within these walls. You would think that every single grant would serve the entire greater Toledo area. Um, I'll give some examples uh, in a, a slide or two about geography, um, different examples of that. But you wanna ask, what's the geography? And what's the priority geography? Some grants have a target that they wanna serve. For example, a grant may only wanna serve Wood County um, as the priority, but they will look at requests from other counties as well. Um, you also wanna ask, what's the minimum and maximum amount that I can request? If you're asking you know, a large amount or too small to even you know, receive consideration, you've definitely not spent your time wisely because believe it or not, there are grants here where you have to have a minimum amount requested to even receive, uh, to even have the committee review it. And yes, that will disqualify you if you do not request at least the minimum. Now, what happens if you request more? The committee may or may not consider it. It just really depends. Um, there are trends, meaning there's a range that funds will generally consider. And there are some times where there's no trends. So you definitely wanna ask. You wanna ask, can I request multi-year funding? Some grants will consider a multi-year request. And if you're not familiar with the multi-year request or even how to prepare a multi-year request, well, then you definitely wanna have that conversation with the organization to figure out if this is what you want. Because um, traditionally, if you're seeking multi-year funding, first you gotta find out if the fund will accept that. And secondly, be able to explain that within your application, that this is year one of five, this is year one of three. Um, there are definitely trends. If the fund does accept multi-year requests, how many years will they accept? One, two, three? So you definitely wanna ask that before you spend time actually writing details into your grant. Um, can you complete a grant application for multiple funds at the foundation? And I'm gonna tell you the answer is yes. If there are multiple funds here and you've submitted an application, you may have the same program officer, you may have a different program officer, but you can definitely apply for more than one grant that is being held here at the foundation. But keep in mind that every fund is going to have a different priority. And you definitely want to be specific to what that fund is asking for. Um, does the fund support personnel costs? Does it support building expenses? What are the priorities? Sometimes that's listed already on the grant guidelines. Sometimes it's not. So you definitely want to ask those questions and also, what's the approval timeline? As Zach mentioned before, sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's eight months, sometimes um, specifically during COVID, it was a relatively short turnaround period. So you definitely wanna ask those questions because each fund is going to have a different approval and a notification timeline. You can ask about the review process. Who's actually reviewing it? Well, we won't tell you who specifically is going to review it, but what's the review process? Does it go straight to a committee? Does the board review everything? And the answer is yes and yes. There are multiple layers of review here at the foundation. And I can say every foundation, there's definitely a difference between private foundations 
and community foundations. Program officers here, we do not make the final determination. That's the board. So just keep that in mind. If you're calling and you're asking for, you know, specific information, we're going to tell you so much because we are not the ultimate decision when it comes to the grants. And that's how you have a conversation. That's how you engage a funder, specifically when you're searching for grants. And when you close out the conversation, you'll probably receive information on how to access our online portal. Not every grant um, and other foundations may use the same portal system or even the same way to submit an application, but keep that in mind. Here at this foundation, we do not accept paper applications. We do not accept emailed applications. It's only through the portal. So all of those things you definitely wanna know in advance. That way you can craft your application for this particular fund that you're seeking. Um, and I'm gonna mention this several times. If you have questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. If you have a question right now about what I just said, um, I believe you can unmute yourself if you have a quick question. Not, I will steamroll through my next two points. Okay, what is due diligence and geography? So uh, Zach, can you advance my slide, please? Thank you. Now the term due diligence is a term that is used um, generally from funders. This is a complete list for our foundation. There are some foundations, whether it's private, I'm um, in other funding sources, whether it's government, they're gonna ask for different documents that are called due diligence or attachments. So you definitely wanna have your project budget, your board list, your IRS letter. I'm not gonna read all the information on the slide, but keep in mind, it's different for every funder and you wanna have it specific to what the funder's asking for. And I'm gonna give uh, some examples of what that means. But before you submit it, you definitely want to proofread it. Um, believe it or not, mistakes, on these documents is fairly common and it's completely, um, you, you definitely have the time to make those corrections before you submit it. So keep that in mind that you wanna put your best foot forward when you're presenting your organization and your project um, when you're submitting an, an application. Next slide. So this is an example of a board list. And um, I definitely enjoy interaction. Maybe it's because um, of this platform. So can anybody tell me what they think about this attachment? Is it right? Is it wrong? Um, any thoughts? It would probably be beneficial if you listed, <clears throat> excuse me, what organizations that they work for. True. Any other thoughts? Perhaps how long um, they've been on the board or um, even to make it um, more visually appealing if they could have like a headshot. Okay, okay. So- It also should have their board positions. Good point. So with this particular attachment, the correct answer is it depends. So all of those answers are correct, but it also depends. When you are applying for a grant, it will tell you what they wanna know about the board members. It will tell you, you know, whether you have to include their affiliation as it was mentioned you know, from, um, from someone during this uh, chat. You definitely want to include their board position and their tenure, but keep in mind, you want to see what is listed in the grant guideline. It will tell you what you wanna know. And if you wanna include photos or any additional information, then that's completely up to you. There's not gonna be a penalty for um, including headshots. I've actually received those before and sometimes the committee 
does appreciate that information and sometimes it's, it's um, not necessary. So either way, all of those answers are correct. So moving on to the next slide, please. So this is an example of a project budget and I'll accept three responses on any thoughts about this budget. Well, I'll just go ahead and give the answer. So when it comes to the project budget, the header is correct. However, giving your fiscal year does not help. We would need to know what is the project timeline. When you're submitting a grant, we need to know what we are funding, which is what you would list in the notes section. Now I've seen it done many different ways. But basically you wanna answer these basic questions. What is your entire project budget? Now you can have multiple funding sources that you're soliciting, that you've secured, but you want to make sure that we know which ones you've secured and which ones that you are soliciting to make sure that your budget is correct. You wanna make sure that your math is correct whether you're uploading an Excel document, a Word document, or a PDF, you wanna make sure that your math is correct. You wanna make sure at the top, instead of having your fiscal year, you wanna have your project start and your end date. Because once the, if the project is approved, you cannot use funds retroactive. So just keep that in mind. Now, can you, can you request a portion of a project that has already started, it depends. Again, you wanna have that conversation in advance um, before you submit if possible. And you can identify how funds would be used in many different ways. Some grantees like to include the notes section, which is helpful. Um, others will highlight that this is what we're requesting that the funds be used for. I see a hand up, Rebecca. Yeah, so if, it is, if you're applying for a multi-year um, grant, mm -hmm. would you just go like for the first year, like up in that spot? If you're applying for multi-year funding, um, you would definitely want to lay out the entire project. So if it's multiple year, you definitely want to cover multiple years. Okay. Um, now, in, in some cases, you may have where the, the second year or, you know, whatever the number of years that you're seeking may be solicited funds, and that's fine. Uh, but you definitely want to have all those expenses laid out because the committee is going to ask, how are these funds going to be used? if approved in the coming years. Okay, and if you are demonstrating, say um, say annually, you get like $20,000 in just community donations to your organization, um, and then you are listing that, say you're seeking like a five-year, multi-year grant, mm -hmm. would you have to demonstrate a history of receiving that $20,000 every year? The way that would be demonstrated uh, would be through your operating budget, but other documents, we don't request those additional documents. But if you're receiving other dollars, such as donations, fee for service, any other revenue, you definitely want to have that listed if it's connected to your project budget. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions before I continue on? Okay, next slide. So I mentioned geography. Um, now keep in mind that we have multiple funds. That means multiple funding sources here at the foundation. 
And um, I'm going to give an example of two. My portfolio does include some corporate as well as some field of interest funds here at the foundation. So first, solar is an example of the geography is U.S. as well as international, meaning you can apply if you are a 501c3 based in the United States and your project is in the U.S. or if your project is overseas. And it's also vice versa. If you're an NGO, which is um, the international equivalent to 501c3, you can apply for this particular fund and the project can be based internationally or in the US. So First Solar does accept applications from everywhere in the US as well as international. So that's one example of the geography is different for that fund versus what we call community funds. Um, the, the new name is Community Impact and Community Builder. That geography is different. It is Northwest Ohio and Southeast Michigan. And for a complete list of all those different counties and cities and nuances, it's actually in the application itself. So if you're outside of that geography area, you will not receive um, review only because that particular fund has a specific geography, which is different than First Solar. And I can tell you that different funds have a different geography preference. So again, going back to, you wanna have that conversation with the program officer before you submit, because um, you don't wanna waste your time writing a grant that won't receive committee review. Um, next slide, please. So this is uh, just a brief summary um, of our application process. We have a portal, an online portal, which I'm a huge fan of, uh, maybe because I spend so much time with it, but it's an easy way for grant writers and the foundation to manage everything through the grant process that uh, Zach talked about earlier, from the grant writing all the way through the monitoring process if you are approved. So our portal, if you go to our website and I'm starting in the corner with the arrow, um, you wanna click on the, the three little dots that are dancing, even though on the slide it, it, it looks like they're curving. You wanna click on that, that'll open up to grants. And then you wanna look at open funding opportunities. And then you wanna click how to apply. There's a light blue tab that says click here. That will give you easy access to the portal. And I'm gonna recommend if you are a grant seeker, you definitely want to bookmark, if you're familiar with that process, the portal once you actually are on the page because that will manage all of your information, uh, whether you're writing grants or you're trying to submit your report, all of those different pieces are all on the same site. It also allows you to seek, um, to actually search for different grants through the portal as well. Um, next slide. So once you are ready to apply for grants through our foundation, you want to click on create new account and that will take you to, to the logon page. Your new account should include your organization information, all the information as Zach mentioned about your EIN number because we only fund um, nonprofits. You also want to include the executive director or whoever is the head of your organization, their information you can have your information entered as well. The more information you enter now, it's easier to manage later. If you so happen to forget your password, you actually don't have to call the office. You can click forgot password and it will automatically assist you through that process. We also have video tutorials. Um, there's a list of them on your screen, which will help you through the application process. We also have an additional video tutorial that will assist you once you've been approved to complete your um, grant monitoring, which are your reports and submitting your signed grant agreement. 
there's some additional features that this system does have. Um, it, as Zach mentioned earlier about collaborating and funders, you know, having an interest in that, this portal does allow you to invite other individuals within your organization or within the community to um, submit information. So like, let's say you are working on application and someone else has your budget instead of you recreating it or, or going through the emails back and forth, you can actually invite them to enter the budget into the application itself. You can allow your executive director or anybody else to review it, which I highly recommend. Um, having a second person read it for understanding is always a good thing, um, whether it's grant writing or anything in general that you're sharing with the public. And then you can have someone submit it or you can submit it. Those are a few different features. You can actually print the application through the uh, portal itself. You can print the question list of all the questions within the application. Um, it's actually a, a really easy process. It allows you to view all your submitted grants as well as the grants that you're applying for. And you'll be able to see the status of where they are, whether it was uh, whether it's still in draft, meaning you did not submit it, whether you submitted it, and so on and so forth. Next slide. So what are some common mistakes? Um, I mentioned some previously, and a lot of these mistakes are avoidable. Misspellings. Believe it or not, it is common to see misspelled words or even jargon. Um, I'd use those interchangeably because sometimes you may misspell the jargon and that's not helpful um, for understanding because we, we review the application, but the application also is submitted to a committee who may not have the same understanding of jargon. So it's best to make sure your spelling is correct and to avoid um, any type of jargon. And like I said, it's I recommend having someone else read it for understanding. Um, you want to be specific. Do not be specific to your examples and do not overgeneralize what you do. If you say that you serve the community, give some examples. If you engage in outreach, give some examples. Don't just generalize. It's very difficult to review when you don't have a lot of specific information. Make connections to your responses. Make connections to the community and your organization. Connect your project to your evaluation and make sure you review the grant guideline. If there are specific things that we're looking for, make sure you're answering those questions within your responses. Um, yes, that's, that's what I got for that section. Next, there we go. So you've submitted your application. Now it's time for the review process. Now keep in mind, I am only speaking to the foundation I represent. Site visit, for example, is different things for different organizations and different foundations. Here at GTCF, a site visit is really a conversation about your project. That's what a site visit is. Due to COVID, that's done virtually now. Um, before COVID, we would have that site visit in person, and it's discussing your project and the application. You don't have to, if you're serving kids, you don't have to have the kids there. It's, it's not that type of visit. It's finding out about your project and answering questions that we couldn't um, find out except through the site visit. We're also going to research your organization. We're going to research your project, research the organization, the population you're serving, even the evaluation methods. Um, I can't tell you how many times I, I will see the word evidence-based or best practice. Well, I have to be able to find that and justify that. Collateral calls. If you mention particular organizations as your partners, we're going to confirm that. Um, those are examples of collateral calls. Uh, next slide. I believe that's that's it for me. 
Any questions for Artisha after? Well, she has another slide coming up, a couple, but any questions <laughs> over what she just did? <laughs> yeah, so Artisha, um, so, well, so then the grant submission isn't really finite. In other words, I, I, we followed everything in the grant guidelines. You know, we've put together our proposal, we provided the documentation you need, but let's say that during, as it's being reviewed, there are additional questions. So that site visit represents an opportunity to expand? Or yes. Okay. Yep, it allows both of us the opportunity to dive deeper. Um, okay. Because our applications have character limits. So there's only so much information that you can provide in the application itself. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think I saw someone else on mute. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Zach. We've emailed each other. So okay. nice to meet you. I have a lot of questions. I'll just ask one right now. <laughs> and it might be for Zach. You had said something about your request should be, I think, 25, should not be more than 25% of your budget. Yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. Okay. Um, are you referring to the number that the grantor would see on your 990? which in our case might be $85,000? Or are you referring to 25% of the budget that you're creating because you need more money? So we, we have 85, we need to hire a second staff person, say it's 30,000, okay? Now the operating budget for the nonprofit is 85 plus 30. Would it be feasible to request grant a grant that would be 25% of that? Oh, let's see, 85 and 30. <laughs> so let's say you now have an operating budget of 100, 125,000 based on money that you hope comes in and based on money that's already in. Would it be feasible to say, okay, 25% of 120,000 is the max that I'm allowed or that I should request? Well, I would definitely just use that as a rule of thumb and not get too like, exact on the numbers. But in that scenario, um, it's going to be off your operating budget. So it wouldn't be necessarily what you had in your 990 because that would have been last year. So in this scenario, let's say that employee you're, you're planning on adding is getting hired this year. So that would be part of your operating budget for this year. So it would be that overall number, 25% of your, your expanded number in that situation. Okay. Um, I, a I, I would also throw in um, that it, it, it depends. Um, yeah, it, it also depends because here at the foundation, we do have a particular fund that is for pilot programs and it's to pilot. And if you're able to justify how you're going to sustain it, then that would definitely weigh on um, that percentage that you're talking about. But generally, as, as Zach said, that is a good rule to keep because you, you, you don't want, we don't want to tip your organization too much by providing too much funding, which is something that all foundations are concerned about by tipping you too far. But when you say pilot, that makes me think of a new project. This is a nonprofit that's been operating on a wing and a prayer since like 2017 um, on one guy and volunteers. And now we really do need to pull in a second person. Would that be considered a pilot since the pilot part is the second person? It depends. Uh. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it depends on if the pilot is the, the, if the project itself that this person is working on as a pilot, if they're scaling up or an innovation piece um, that is being added, there are specific funds at the foundation that do look at personnel um, specifically, be, and there's some that do not. So again, it all depends. Sometimes it's that they will consider um, adding a staff or um, supporting a program with the understanding that the staff is connected to the program. So um, you'll probably hear me say more than once, it, it just all depends on, on how it's written and how you would sustain it. Because um, there's different 
sustainable methods um, that can be used for different types of organizations, whether it's, you know, this is your, you're, you're going to use this position to increase revenue in certain ways. So again, it just all depends. It's hard to give like one, ex one concrete response. I might email you <laughs> with some specific <laughs> questions. Is that okay? Yep. Uh, well, either one of us, our emails are, are on the, the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, I think I saw one person unmute. Yes. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, what um, do you mean by, uh, like, specifically when you say jargon? Uh, could you clarify that a little? Um, well, something I've seen recently is LMI, low to mod income. Oh. Um, like that is that is jargon. That is, you know, whether it's an abbreviation okay. or jargon that's specific to your organization. Sometimes we'll use jargon um, within a particular organization and it's kind of our short conversation, but an outsider won't understand it or may not have, like someone may read it and think LMI means something completely different. Okay, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Okay, so I did have two comments on what um, Artisha covered and not huge or anything, but if anyone wants some more details on budgets, um, I don't have the links handy with me because I didn't want to close any windows and screw anything up here. Um, but I can send you um, classes through Candid. Um, there's an introduction to budget proposals, but also we did a program back in December that was a two or three hour workshop and it covered budgets really in depth and I can link directly to that section of the workshop. So feel free to send me an email if you need more details on how budgets work. And also um, Artisha talked about um, talking to program officers and um, for other types of foundations that can be, uh, it can look completely different. So even for, for government program officers, so a government program officer has to speak to everyone fairly. Um, so they might be able to answer only specific questions or I give you 15 minutes to ask questions. So that's something to consider, but also small private foundations might not be able to answer any of your questions whatsoever because they don't have any staff and they might just have one trustee. So there's a full gamut out there on what will and will work. And uh, we'll go back to uh, Artisha's slogan of it depends. <laughs> so uh, real quick here, just the, the post award pieces of the life cycle of a grant, um, you've got outcomes and outputs and it's important to know the difference between those two words. So outcomes, well, actually I'll go with outputs. Outputs is just a, a, a number, essentially. It's how many people you served. It's uh, we, we helped 15 kids in this after school program. We planted 45 trees along the riverbed. Um, that's an output. The outcome would be uh, grades improved from our after school program, or we were able to filter out, uh, this might be hard to come up with actually, but filter out so, so much um, chemicals in, in the water supply. Um, that one, like I said, might be a little far fetched, but that is the outcome versus the output. And grant makers care more about the outcome than the outputs, but it's also sometimes it's good to have that quick number as well. Um, evaluation, of course, that's, like I said, going to be baked into the front part of your grant. You should have a good idea of how you're going to evaluate um, by the time you submit the grant proposal. And sometimes it's going to be specifically outlined in what you've already submitted. And you need to be perfectly aware of what the reporting criteria will be and, and when that deadline is. Because if you miss a deadline and you miss it by a lot, um, that's really going to impact your chances of, of getting something from that funder again in the future. Okay, and then this next one is back to Artisha. So when it comes to reporting, um, as Zach mentioned, you definitely want to be mindful of deadlines um, and re reporting requirements. Every foundation, every funder is gonna have a different type of reporting system. So here at GTCF, we, um, as I mentioned before, have the online uh, portal, which actually manages all of the reporting. The way our system is set up, you'll receive a reminder 14 days before it's due that you have a report to submit. Now, our reporting system 
is basically a fill-in template version, meaning there's a question, you answer it. There's a question, you answer it. And there's always the opportunity to upload any additional information that you have related to the project. Um, and I will say that all of the committees that I work with and all the committees here at the foundation, they do enjoy photos. So if you can, I know sometimes there's privacy issues, there's um, other matters that may come into play, but if you can produce photos, the committees do want to see what happened with the project. Um, and photos are the best way to tell your story, um, especially when it comes to committees, if you plan on maintaining those um, relationships. And our portal has a tutorial and it'll be available within the portal itself that will walk you through step-by-step step how to submit your signed grant agreement and how to submit your reports. It's a really short tutorial, maybe a minute and a half to cover all the information that's necessary. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, as I mentioned, you can upload additional attachment if you wanna share additional information. Maybe the project was covered by the media. Maybe it was, you know, maybe you have a YouTube video about it. You know, you can include additional information in multiple ways um, that committees will definitely welcome um, during uh, the review process. And I do also wanna mention what happens or what should you do if your project is delayed. Now, unfortunately, we've had to deal with many, many delays due to COVID. Um, even before COVID, sometimes you're dealing with a partner or a, collaborative, a collaboration and something falls through and your project is delayed. I'm gonna say, don't wait until the deadline. You can actually call and talk to the program officer before the deadline and say, hey, I'm having a problem. Can we talk this through? That's what our job is here at the foundation. Um, I have worked with many different nonprofits that I've um, processed their grants to assist them with figuring out what's the best scenario. Because it's all about how to complete your project in a satisfactory fashion. Um, for example, many projects that I've worked with that had anything dealing with youth or schools, were obviously delayed. So they had to be extended out until times are you know, obviously allowing in person um, with the understanding that they may have to extend it again. You know, a lot of things are still up in the air when you're dealing with different populations or different groups or um, some high risk populations who may not be able to meet in person at all right now. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's better to have the conversation ahead of time than to wait until um, the deadline. Any questions before I turn it back over? Okay, Zach, thank you. Okay, so here we get to my bread and butter. These are gonna be some library tools to help you with finding grants. So. Uh, how are you already looking for grants is my question to, to kind of start this conversation out with. Uh, do you search online? If you do, I want to let you know that less than 10% of foundations have websites. So not even Googling grants will help you find a foundation website if it doesn't exist. So you're left with gathering clues from news clips or other organizations donor lists if you do that. Or do you look for RFPs? And I've already stated this fact but uh, less than half of 1% of foundations publish RFPs. And again, that's largely gonna be community foundations um, that, that do that or, or government uh, grants. Do you search GuideStar? That's okay, but GuideStar is not meant for grant searching. So it's actually built for transparency. And so you're not going to get that kind of grant data that you're really gonna benefit from. You, you might be able to access 990s, which is the next one if you look at 990s to do grant searching, um, that's just okay. It's just a really old fashioned way of looking for grants. Now there are so many uh, better tools available, especially um, available 
for free through the library. So you, you only get um, a snapshot of one year at a time when you look at a 990 rather than a funder's uh, funding trend history. So it, it really limits you and they're not searchable for certain details. So the library tool that we have to kind of supplement everything is Foundation Directory Online. And I'm just gonna call it FDO mostly. So FDO is unsurpassed in its scope, its depth, and its currency. It has uh, over 235,000 funders in it, 2 million plus recipients, 22.4 million plus grants. I actually had to add um, update this slide today. They've really, really ramped that up. I think the last time I presented this, they only had 4 million grants. And so now it's 22.4 million. So it is really... Um, uh, uncomparable to other databases and it's depth. So it has detailed profiles of funders, grants, recipients, and companies, companies that do grants that is, and it is updated daily. It pulls from grant maker websites, annual reports, published application guidelines, philanthropic press, federal government grants, over 30 other information sources. And of course there's the option for funders to do direct reporting on this website. So I am gonna pull it up I always debate whether it's better on Zoom to show you the website or to just kind of do some screenshots. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna pull it up here in a second to just do you a quick overview. If you're interested in it, um, you need to sign up for the March 18th class though, because that's going to be a deeper dive in this resource. When you are looking at it though, you're gonna to wanna to ask yourself, and this is for just grant searching in general, who are you serving? Where are they? And what are you doing for them? And that's going to help you best identify foundations that align with what you're doing and where you're doing it. And these are just some questions to have in the back of your mind when we, when we take a look at some of these tools. Uh, we will wanna ask, do I meet this funder's requirements? Always a first rule of thumb there is, are you even eligible? Is my mission or project's goal a priority for this funder? How big are the grants? Are they even gonna cover what you're asking? Does this funder support organizations like mine? Um, that's kind of hard to determine sometimes. So I'll show you where, where to find those things. And do I know anyone associated with this funder, which can kind of open the door sometimes. And sometimes it can't, sometimes foundations don't operate that way, but it's always good to know if you have some overlap. Okay, now I'm going to switch sharing over here. So let me, just give me one second. If anyone has any questions though, feel free to unmute and ask. Okay, so you should be seeing the library's website now. If, if you're not, if it's, let me know. Okay, so um, this is the grant and nonprofit support page, which is actually a new development for our website. We didn't have this as a breakout page before. So to get here, you can go to the top menu from toledolibrary.org and from the middle column, select the third one down, grant and nonprofit support. And uh, this is going to be quite the, the add to your arsenal for grant research, as well as other tools, which um, if you aren't able to do the March 18th program, I fully recommend you schedule an appointment with me. There are some really powerful tools on here that we won't even get to talk about today. Um, but we have some local regional resources for funding here, um, some of our upcoming programs where you can sign up and then uh, research tools. So primarily what, what I wanted to show you is that we actually have remote access to foundation directory online right now. And that in the past was unheard of. We've only been able to offer it just at main library in downtown Toledo. But uh, one of the silver linings of the pandemic and people not being able to go anywhere is that we've been able to offer this remotely. So what I'll show you today is called the professional product. Um, what you'll be able to access remotely is the essentials product. So there are gonna be a few, pe few features that are turned off, um, but main library is open and those will be available to you out of Grant's computer. And I see a chat here. How do we register for the presentation on the 18th? So you can either do that through the Center for Nonprofit Resources website, c4npr.org, or um, on this page I'm showing you right now, you can- Zach, click. Zach, I'm gonna grab, it's Heather. I'm gonna grab the link and put it in. Perfect, thank you. So I'm not gonna click on this link today because like I said, this is the essentials version. I'm gonna show you the professionals version. What we do here is we're gonna ask those three questions. What are we doing? Where are we doing? And wh who are we doing it for? 
Um, however, that last question is optional. It doesn't always help you. Um, so sometimes I just do the first two. So uh, my sample is usually um, a, an organization I used to work for was an arts education. So let's do arts education in Ohio. Let me just hit search. I could have added for students. I could have added for senior citizens. They could have added a population on there. I don't always like to do that because sometimes that stuff is not embedded in the grant data. But if you have that, it's always good to do multiple searches and try it with or without. We can see that it did do some auto assigning here for what I typed in. Uh, definitely check that first. It does have some things in here that I'm gonna wanna remove. Um, ballet is too specific for me. Orchestral music is too specific for me. Um, it did give me a population. We can leave that on there. Um, it should have updated already. Yeah, it did. And then I don't want a specific support strategy in this case here. So we will go over all of those details um, in the future on the next program, all of these search filters or um, an appointment with me. But what you'll see, oh no, actually, it did sign me into the Essentials version. Give me one second. Sometimes if I log in between the two, it will carry over. Okay, that's the professional version. Okay, one second to get back to where we were. Okay, so now you can see um, these four boxes are, are available where on the essential versions, these two boxes were not. Um, so that is the main difference between the two databases, the remote and the one here at Main Library. But what I'm just going to show you today is going to be these grant maker profiles so you understand what is available out there. So we'll just click on one. It doesn't really matter in this case, although I will warn you, you'll see a lot of community foundations that may or may not be applicable to projects in Lucas County. So there's a lot of data that's being presented here. So again, I'm trying to come up with someone who is going to support my mission and project and my location. So right off the bat, we see these three graphs. So I search for arts education. I can see that um, education is in their top three. However, art and culture is toward the bottom here. So I know that they fund what I'm doing, um, whether it's a high priority, depending on what exactly I'm looking for within arts um, could be a little low. We can always click deeper here and see within arts and culture what levels they're funding. So we can see that they're primarily doing performing arts, cultural awareness, art services. And if we keep going, we get to arts education. So just in these past five years, the George Gunn Foundation has done $2.8 million in arts education. And there are those grants down here. I could do the breakouts and look at them individually. So. I know that they're funding what I'm doing. Oh, I went too far here. And I can see from the second graph that they're funding where I am. And we can go a little deeper here. And we see Lucas County isn't highlighted, but I bet if I widen the net here, we'll get one. Yeah, so they have funded Lucas County in the past, but only three. So we're not a priority location wise, but the door is open. And then how big are the grants? So um, if I'm looking for $10,000, I can see that this particular foundation does offer grants within the range that I'm looking. In fact, they offer in every single range. You don't always see that. But um, it's good that right now I know in that sense, this is a good funder. And then I always tell everyone to just jump down then to the application and RFP section. We can see a couple open RFPs. So this one actually does publish requests for proposals. But then we get all that data on limitations so we can see that they primarily give to other areas, but that we always have to wonder what's that word primarily mean. So probably something we would wanna reach out to the foundation for. We see how they want us to approach them. Um, once you review the eligibility on your website, complete the online application process. Here are the pieces they're asking for us for, how often they meet and when their funding decisions are made, some additional information. So. This is the kind of tool to use to find funders that are going to align and support your organization. I think a lot of times we kind of get trapped in the idea of RFPs and looking only for those out there. 
But if you can find just anything on any funder across the country, you're going to be better off than limiting yourself to RFPs. And there's so much more information to go over on this website. Um, here's that contact information that told us to go to their website to do an application. But um, if you're interested in learning the rest of these pieces here, um, please reach out to me or sign up for the March 18th class. And then one other thing I wanted to highlight about finding grants while I'm on our website is this database called Grantmakers IL. That's an open source database. It's very similar to Foundation Directory Online. It doesn't have as many foundations in it. Um, so that's gonna be probably a more pivotal tool for us if I ever um, lose access to offering FDO remotely. Uh, that might happen after 2021 is over, depending on what Candid wants to do with the pandemic. Um, right now we're good through this year, but this is um, essentially a very similar product that's just open source. So let me switch back to the presentation here. Again, if any questions, please let me know. Okay. So a couple last pieces here. Um, we're just gonna wanna talk about visibility and transparency. Uh, you need to be aware of your public facing persona and that's gonna be your website, social media channels. Those are gonna be obvious things, but do know that funders are checking that. Um, and then I have linked that down there, GuideStar. GuideStar is probably one of the most um, visible websites. There is also ProPublica, um, Charity Navigator, but, but GuideStar I think is more primary than that. And that's a website where you can take control of a profile that likely already exists. It's, it's based off of the 990s that are filed each year. And you can prove that you are uh, responsible for that organization and build your, uh, your profile to get certain levels. You can see on this one, we have, like, we have lot industries, which is at the bronze level. That means they have a little bit of information, but they could provide more. Toledo Society for the Blind being platinum. Platinum is the highest you can get on this database, which means they provide uh, quite an, a, a lot of information on their organization. And foundations are using this. Uh, Artisha, do you guys use GuideStar? Uh, yes, we do. Um, all nonprofits go through a GuideStar check. Perfect. See, so it, it definitely matters. So if, you, if your organization hasn't already made the effort to grab your profile and start informing it, please do so. Um, I can try to help you get the profile. You'll need to have some information on hand to do so. Um, also, the database that I showed you, Foundation Directory Online, it's owned by the same company, and they've done some integration. So now when you're looking at some of those recipient organizations that have received grants that you're looking at, uh, you will see their badge. So you'll be able to see if a foundation primarily gives to a bronze plus organization or gold organizations or only platinum organizations. So it's becoming more and more important to be on, on GuideStar. And here's just an example of what that landing page looks. So this is for WGTE. Uh, they do not have a badge, I don't believe, but this is just already on there. This is pulled from a 990. It's, uh, and they found their logo. So th this profile already exists. So I completely encourage you to search for your organization on GuideStar. I have a question from Kay. Do we have access to GuideStar? Um, so there are, you, have, you said that it's not free, and that's true. There are some things on here that you absolutely have to pay for. We don't have that subscription level. You, um, as an organization taking your control over it, would be able to uh, take your profile for free. And then you can do a free search on there. It's going to be really low level. Most things you do have to pay for, but we do not have a subscription to that. Uh, I am advocating for it, though. So hopefully someday we will. Okay, so now we're just kind of wrapping up here with next steps. So here are a couple webinars from Candid that you can access for free. Introduction to Finding Grants, Introduction to Fundraising Planning. Again, the Finding Grants side, you can always reach out to me. Um, but some people prefer to do things at their own pace. So here's also a playlist that Candice, Candice, Candid has on YouTube that can take you through the steps of using Foundation Directory Online. I also want to recommend this book. So 
This is the only grant writing book you'll ever need. And I think it's a great resource. We have uh, at least 12 copies of the library. And we also have an ebook format. It's gonna cover that whole gamut of getting ready for grants, writing grants, working with funders. It's very approachably written. It has a bunch of templates in the back. So that's always my recommendation for diving deeper into getting the, the, that, that piece more solid. I mean, this, this grant class here, we don't even cover the writing aspect yet. So there's still more to learn, definitely. Um, but happy to put that book on hold for you if you want it. And this slide is not updated, unfortunately. So <laughs> here's my contact information. That is fine. But that next class is not November 2021. That clearly has already happened. So that's 2 p.m. March 18th, 2021. Uh, Heather linked to it in the chat, and I see a question here. Let me look at the chat here. What was the title of the book? It is the only grant writing book you'll ever need. It is by Arlen, uh, Ellen Karsh and Arlen Sue Fox. We did a, a book discussion over the summer on this particular title, so um, it's my favorite go-to recommendation, the only grant writing book you'll ever need, and I don't necessarily believe that. It's always nice to have more than one, but it is a pretty good one. All right, and then this last slide here is for you, Artisha. So as I mentioned earlier, the foundation uh, that I represent has several open competitive funding opportunities. Here's just a brief snapshot um, of the grants that are coming up. Anything that was uh, close to deadline, I didn't really wanna list here, but if you have any questions about that, I encourage you to go to the website toledocf.org and you'll be able to link to the grant guideline to contact that specific program officer with any particular questions. There's my contact information. And as always, make sure you sign up for the center's newsletters. You can get all the deadlines sent to you. They're featured so you can see which ones may apply and which ones may not apply to your particular organization. All right, we could take any questions anyone may have at this point so over what we've talked about or maybe something that you might have a burning question on. Hopefully we would have an answer to that. But again, it depends. <laughs> and before we sign off, yes, let's take questions, but there's also some resources in this area that I'd like to highlight through the center. Okay, could you explain more the meaning of grant cycle? Sure, so grant cycle, it's that, um, I can try to pull up that graphic again. Nope, that's not, I'm, my brain does not know how to share anymore. <laughs> Let me go back a few slides. Oh, more slides than I thought. <laughs> You're very techie, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> just hit the arrow until it gets there, right? So grant cycle, um, it's just beginning to end here, pre-award and post-award. Um, it really just breaks it down so that, you know, you're not just thinking of it's the application and getting the grant. It's more than that. It's the, the intensive process of finding funding, which I, I showed you and we can talk further about. Um, but it's also preparing the proposal, which doesn't take a day. It takes a lot of time and you have to engage a lot more than just one employee to do to the submission process, especially with, with the way that we do online things, you know, that can add more layers. You have to have certain character limits like Artisha alluded to. And then it's the acceptance process, um, signing anything that you would need to for your award acceptance. And then moving on to actually administering your program. Um, with the setup, which probably you should have already had in mind beforehand, and then monitoring it to make sure it's going adequately and as you promised in your grant proposal, and then any evaluation that you might have to close out. So that's what I mean by the grant cycle, beginning to end, how um, you go through each step. Got a couple more here. Having worked in nonprofits in the past with religious affiliations, how many grantors uh, seem ex to exclude religious institutions as recipients? Is it better to look for private foundations for funding? So that's also gonna be, and it depends, I'm gonna stop sharing here. 
um, because uh, I know that the Greater Toledo Community Foundation does have some funds that we'll give to religious organizations. I'll let Artisha speak to that. Um, and then I'll talk about um, FDO here in a second. So uh, GTCF also assists with other grant funding opportunities that do not exclude um, religious affiliation. Um, generally speaking, if you have a 501c3 through a nonprofit, which does include churches, you actually are eligible to seek funds. However, keep in mind that some funds are going to want, they're gonna want you to seek a funding for projects that actually impact the community and not specifically your place of worship. So sometimes projects include the, the place of worship and the community and that's fine, um, but they're really looking for community impact. So yes, a, um, a church would qualify for that as well. And then there was a question on what's the best way to get denial feedback? Um, honestly, it, it all depends. When it comes to declines, there are several different reasons why a request can be declined. Um, and it may have nothing to do with the contents of the application. Um, the first thing would be funding. Um, there's a cap on how much is available for different types of funds, and they may have reached their capacity for that year. Um, if it's something that didn't qualify, for example, geography, or, or if it wasn't from a 51C3, the letter will generally say that, that it didn't qualify for that particular reason. Um, any other type of feedback that you're looking for, I would probably just call that program officer that's listed on the grant guideline. That's always my go-to, contact that person. Um, that way they may be able to provide maybe some trends from that particular committee of what they were looking for that year. I will say I've had, I've had instances where committees were impacted by current events like COVID. Um, so some projects were higher priority at that time versus others. Um, so just keep some of that in mind that it may not have anything to do with the content of the actual application itself. Sometimes it's just they have a certain pot of money and you were number 17 and they funded up to number 16. So um, this book also has a section on kind of follow up if you are interested in checking it out about approaching funders after the fact. And a lot of times it's all, the, the advice in here is also about your attitude um, to not take it personally and to just be really open to any suggestions that they have to, to your organization. And sometimes it's, please apply again. Next year, we might be able to get you in. But um, sometimes it, it, you just need to be willing to take that rejection in a positive way. Uh, and then I wanted to enter that religious question again, the religious organization. Uh, in a foundation directory online, you can sort by that. So we can, when we're searching, say you're doing an after school program, but it's for, uh, just gonna, as an example, like a Catholic organization, we can look for foundations that have in the past given specifically to Catholicism. So there are ways that we can also filter that out. Um, and the, the limitations that are listed on the profile will say does not give to religious organizations if that's one of their priorities. So any other questions? Okay, well you guys can think about it. I'm gonna hop over to the C4NPR website. So let me grab that. Hmm. Interesting, all right, here we go. Okay, so if you haven't been to our website, it's like there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of resources out there. One of the really great things is we implemented a new website about a year ago and it has an artificial intelligence search box which really makes it a whole lot easier to find things. Um, Artisha had mentioned the e-news. I do encourage you to sign up for that. You can just scroll to the bottom of the homepage and sign up, it's no cost. And um, among the things that are covered are um, professional development opportunities, upcoming grants, et cetera. So another thing that I want to make you aware of is that we have a blog. This is another way, particularly if you want to get on an RSS feed a notification, as we post blogs, postings, you'll get notification of them. Oh, so it just happens that 
are a couple of candid courses here. So Zach had mentioned the introduction to project budgets. There's also an introduction to fundraising planning. And I learned something new because I'm going to be adding the introduction to finding grants because I didn't know that was out there. You know, there's always new courses coming online and we try to vet those for you. So Zach also mentioned that um, they had the book club around this book that he is highlighting. We're going to test the system here because I'm going to type in book club and make sure this comes up because what we did was we recorded them just like we're recording today. So if you want to follow along, you actually don't need to have read the book to follow along, but there were three sessions. So you could um, go back and you could listen to those and follow along, which I think is a really rich experience. And there's lots of different YouTube videos on, on our channel as well. Another thing that I'd like to highlight is that um, we have this getting help section here. When you click on this, there is a best practices checklist and one of the sections is fundraising. So you can download the checklist, but there's a whole page dedicated to each of the sections in the best practice checklist. So there's a whole page dedicated to fundraising. And we go in and we update as we get information that comes online. In addition to that, also in the getting help section, there is a grant resource center with several pages to it. So you're welcome to check that out. All of these resources are available at no cost on the website. Finally, um, under the, uh, let me close this one, under a nonprofit leader, we curate Nonprofit Fundamentals 101 collection. And this was actually born out of this workshop because we'd run a workshop and then about three days later, inevitably, someone would call and say, when are you having the next workshop? And people can't wait another quarter or another six months for a workshop. And we didn't have digital recording at the time. So what we did was we started curating all these different no cost video based training I don't think there's anything in the collection that's more than an hour. If it is, it's like an hour five, an hour 10. Some of them are much shorter than that. So this is all free training that you can do online at your own pace. And then we ended up building out the collection. These tracks reflect the focus areas inside our nonprofit management certificate program. So if you're considering doing that program, these are really good primer videos just to get you up to speed or if you want tools to share with your board for example there's some board governance things that you could say let's everybody watch this and talk about it at the next board meeting if you're interested in board education let's see what else here the recording from today and the powerpoint will be posted up onto the website and then um, i just wanted to share one thing it, i'm always fascinated at the timing at which people apply for these grants. Because some people apply in the last day. Some people apply within the last few hours. Some people apply within the last few minutes. And I mean, I can't even imagine the stress that that would bring doing that. But if you don't do a little bit of planning, then you're not gonna be able to take advantage of all the great tips that Zach and Artisha gave you, including getting someone to give a second set of eyes review on this, are there typos? Is there jargon? Are there, is there a better way to present something? Like a second fresh set of eyes. If you could just adopt that step alone and do a little bit of planning around that, I'd be willing to bet that you would really strengthen any proposal that you might submit. The other thing, and I've been listening along, I don't think I'm repeating what Artisha said, but if I did, it's an important message and I'm repeating it. If, if you are planning on applying through the GTCF system, I would encourage you to go and open the account now if you don't have one, because you don't wanna run into any technical problems or have questions opening up an account at the same time as you're trying to put your application in to the grant. So if you don't have an account, go ahead and, and start that now, because you'll probably apply at some point. So you may as well get one going. And um, the other thing, just an observation, not every community is as fortunate as we are that you can have the access that is created by the program officers at the Greater Toledo Community Foundation. So I do encourage you to take advantage of that access because, and I'm also just giving you a heads up, you may not get that, don't expect to get that type of access from every funder. 
not every funder is willing to set up a call or a video chat or meet with somebody when we can do that again. And I'm just really grateful that that happens to be the philosophy and the approach that our particular community foundation provides to you. So I would take advantage of that. You know, I work with a lot of people who come and say, I want to start a nonprofit. And I, one of the first questions I'll ask them is, so where's your funding coming from? What's the funding model? Well, I'm going to, I want to start a 501c3 so I can get a grant. It's like, we need to talk. Now, you guys are way ahead of all those folks because you've sat through this program. And I think you will agree that Zach and Artisha do a great job. I mean, there's still lots more to talk about. There's still lots more to learn. But I really want to thank Zach and Artisha for taking the time today because I think this is invaluable to sit down and walk through all these different pieces so you can at least get some traction around your rent making. Okay. So what other questions can we answer for you today? I see that there's some contact information went into the chat box and you will get access to the PowerPoint. So don't worry about that. Um, what else can we help you with today? Well, so if there's nothing, you know where we are, you know how to connect with us. And um, I hope that, oh, hang on, we have something. If a funder site says, that it's in by invite only. Who wants to take that one? Okay. I can. And I actually, usually I, I try to put that in there, but I think maybe I forgot. So um, my, my piece of advice for that is that the door is closed for now and that the door is not always closed. That just means, um, well, there, it could always be closed. Let me, let me give you the two scenarios. One, the foundation may be set up to only give to a specific organization or area and, um, it, you would want to obviously reach out to that foundation to get that information. And they're never probably going to be able to donate to another organization. The other scenario is they just don't want to be inundated with applications and proposals. So the door is closed for now, and you're going to need to take time to build that relationship. And so um, again, it's going to be reaching out both scenarios. You're going to want to reach out and get that information and um, send that information to them if you have some some things to share but you never want to share things without permission because that's not going to help the relationship you want to talk to someone before just sending off your information to their foundation that's all i have i don't know if you had anything else to add to that but well, um our process here at the foundation is is uh, very similar um but i will say the best way to get invited is for us to know who you are um so that should be done beforehand because once an invitation only list or an invite only list is created, that's it. Um, I can say from my time here at the foundation, there are definitely opportunities that have opened um, to different types of nonprofits. For example, Spark. Um, Spark is, if you're not familiar with Spark, I, I implore you to visit the foundation's website. But Spark, because of the, the nature of the fund, that invite only process will change every year. So the best way for us to be able to and have up-to-date information is to know about your organization, the type of work that you're doing. That way, when we have requests, we can put together a list fairly quickly uh, because that's what the funders are going to ask from us. Any other questions? <laughs> Okay, well, oh, hang on. Stranahan <laughs> states invitation only and that we should go to their website. Does that mean we should also go through your website? Is that the Stranahan that's listed on the foundation website or is that through? Yeah, she's nodding, yeah. Through our website? Yes, mm -hmm. Stranahan Foundation is listed at Toledo Community Foundation and it says invitation only. And if you follow the links, it tells you to go to the Stranahan Foundation, and then they have a sample of their letter of inquiry to do an invitation only. So if you do that, the follow theirs, should you also let the Toledo Community Foundation know what you're doing? And in that case, um, that's an example, and, and we have quite a few others where we're directed to send you to them 
Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it'll send you right back to our website. It just all depends on how the page is, how the page is set up and what the funder is looking for. In that case, they would be open to receiving some inquiries, but ultimately the application, if it proceeded, would go through GTCF. Um, but there's, you know, different types of invite only processes. So there are many things that are common and run through and are consistent. And you're gonna get frustrated by the many things that it depends. Cause how many times have you heard that today? And it's honestly, it's a lot of legwork. So if you're gonna be in relationship with multiple funders, you, it'll behoove you to understand all the idiosyncrasies and requirements and preferences of each of the funders. Now I know this, this is an extreme example, but some funders have very specific formatting things like they want a certain size of font on a certain size of paper. And if you don't match that, you get bounced. It doesn't matter how good your proposal is. So that's an extreme example, but it, it does take a lot of work just to keep track of, to get into relationship, first of all, with each of these funders, but then also understanding what is expected of you to successfully remain in relationship with a funder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, then we're going to wrap it up today. Again, watch for the posting of the recording if you want to go back and watch or you want to share it with your friends. Um, it will be featured in the next issue of the news e news, so you don't have to go looking for it if you're a subscriber. It'll be posted on the blog, and you know where Zach, Artisha, and I reside if you need more help.